<laughs> educator programs and knowledge and field building up efforts. And we reach students and educators in Durham and beyond. If you haven't already, please check out our website at hillcenter.org. Tonight's event is the fifth in our 2020-21 Community Education Series, where we aspire to offer free practical research-based strategies to help parents, teachers, and professionals better support their students. Many of you have attended CES events before, and we are thrilled to welcome you back. And I wanted to issue a special welcome to those for whom this is your first interaction with Hill. We are grateful to have you here and hope that this is the first of many times we'll see you. Before introducing our speakers for this evening, I want to cover a few housekeeping details for those who have just been joining us in. This session is being recorded and the recording will be sent out tomorrow, along with the slides and a short survey. Please, please take a few minutes to complete the survey for us. Your feedback is incredibly important to us in developing future sessions and past feedback actually helped inform our theme and topic for tonight. There is a link to tonight's slide presentation in the chat if you want to click on that and download it and follow along. And all of our participants, all of you are muted, but you can submit questions and comments at any time uh, using the chat function. Those will go to our presenters in the Hill team and they will be answered at the end. So we will be having a moderated Q&A &E, Q after Glennis and Christina, our presenters tonight, present for about an hour. So thank you again for joining us. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce two of my wonderful colleagues at Hill Learning Center, Glennis Hill Chandler and Christina Steger, two members of our incredible counseling team here at Hill. Ms. Hill Chandler is our Assistant Head of School and Counselor. She's a National Board Certified Counselor and Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor, who is part of the Academic Leadership Team here at Hill. She's co-chair of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and she conducts workshops regularly on topics related to diversity, learning differences, and social-emotional learning. Ms. Steger serves as Hill's Lower School Counselor. She received her Master's in School Counseling from UNC Chapel Hill, is a North Carolina licensed professional school counselor and member of the American School Counselor Association, where she's also completed uh, students with special needs specialist training. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Ms. Hill Chandler and Ms. Steger to share some of their wisdom and experience with all of you. Thank you. Christina, you're muted. Thank you. Yep, thanks for that. <laughs> the quote of the year and last year. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thank you, Beth, um, for those very kind introductions. Today, we will be talking about anxiety. Um, let me go ahead and pull up our presentation and share that. We'll talk about anxiety, um, what it is, its symptomology, and provide tips and strategies for parents, teachers, and school counselors to help ch their children manage their anxiety. We feel like this is a very timely topic um, as the pandemic and social injustice issues have led to increases in student anxiety. And um, with everything that is happening, we anticipate that this trend will continue. While we will be addressing anxiety at a broad level today and not focusing on these specific events, we believe that all of the strategies and tips that we will discuss this evening can be similarly applied to most situations. Our presentation will be split into two sections. The first will discuss anxiety from K through fifth grade students, and the second will apply to teens and older students. So thank you, and without further ado, Christina can get started. All right, so as Glenna said, I'm gonna start um, with anxiety in K through five students. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, um, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. It's a normal reaction to stress. Um, it can even be helpful. It can serve to motivate us. It can serve to protect us. 
um, as a quick thought exercise, just take a moment and think about a time when you have experienced anxiety, but it, that has helped to motivate you or protect you. So anxiety becomes a problem when your body reacts, but there's no danger or no situation for which you need to prepare for. Um, or when it is so excessive that it, it affects your daily functioning, and that can be either in real or imagined circumstances. There are several types of anxiety. Um, I just wanted to touch base on the three that are most commonly seen in K-5 through students. Um, and the first of these is generalized anxiety. And this is when you have many worries um, about a lot of things before they happen. Even when there's little or nothing to provoke that, you may have fears about safety of yourself uh, or that of others. Social anxiety is an excessive self-consciousness and fear of everyday social situations. Um, you may be concerned that others will think badly of you and your student may feel or your child may feel as if they're being negatively judged, even in the face of contrary evidence. And then separation anxiety. Um, and this is anxiety about separating from caregivers there's a worry that um, something may happen to the caregiver while they're separated and that the caregiver will not return. And this can lead to clinginess. Um, the child may try to stay home from school. They may have difficulty falling asleep alone. Um, so those are some of the things you might see with separation anxiety. There are many signs um, of anxiety and it manifests differently in different children. Some may be able to verbalize their worries very well. Um, so you'll know they're having these uncontrollable worries or thoughts and they're able to express those thoughts to you. Others may have more physical symptoms, stomach aches and headaches. And you see this a lot um, in the younger students. They may not really know how to express what they are feeling and express that anxiety and those worries. So it may show up as stomach problems, trouble sleeping, um, headaches, increased heart rate. Um, they may have trouble focusing or with concentration, and this comes from the fact that they are, they're stuck in their worry. So they're stuck in these anxious thoughts and these worry thoughts, and that makes it difficult to concentrate on other things that are going on. So it's interesting to note um, that many of the symptoms that we just looked at of anxiety are also seen in students with ADHD. Um, such as difficulty focusing, trouble sleeping. So sometimes the anxiety may go undiagnosed as the behaviors are attributed to ADHD. So if you have a child um, who's being treated for ADHD and you're not seeing the results that you expect, there may be anxiety underlying as well. There we go, it's like my slide didn't want to change. Okay. <laughs> So what is the goal here? What are we trying to do? Um, the goal is not to eliminate the anxiety, but to help a child manage it. You're not trying to avoid the situations that cause anxiety. Um, this actually can lead to increases in that anxiety. So instead you're trying to help them learn healthy coping mechanisms to manage that anxiety. Um, another quick thought exercise. Take a few moments to think of about a time when you have experienced anxiety and what were some of the coping me mechanisms that you used? And were they helpful? So now that we kind of have an idea of what our goal is today, um, how do we accomplish that? So now we'll get into some of the tips and strategies and I'll start with um, strategies for parents and for home. As mentioned earlier, the goal is not to eliminate the anxiety um, such as removing the stressors, but to help manage with coping mechanisms. Um, through this, the anxiety will decrease over time. Removing the stressor may make your child feel better short term, and we all want our kids to feel better. It's hard to see them, you know, struggling um, with anxiety, and it's just hard to see that. So we want to make them better. Um, so short term, it may help to, you know, eliminate the stressor, but it reinforces the anxiety in the long term. And that's why it's important instead to focus on healthy coping strategies. Anxiety is a very real emotion. Um, so it's important to respect your child's feelings, 
but without empowering that fear. Um, so it's, it's a fine line um, to walk. You know, you want to, them to feel heard and validated, but you want them to know that they can work through it and they can, that you will work together um, to find strategies. An example would be, you know, your child is scared to go to the doctor um, because they're afraid they're going to get a shot. Right, so you don't want to belittle their fears and you, and you don't want to amplify them. Um, so, you know, you can say, I know you're scared and that's okay and I'm here and we'll work through this together. So another thing to avoid is leading questions. Um, again, this may be a way that you could inadvertently increase anxiety. Um, say, for instance, that same child was anxious about going to the doctor. Um, if you, you know, or assume that maybe it's because they're afraid they're going to get a shot and you ask, Oh, are you nervous about going to doc the doctor because you might get a shot and that's going to hurt? Well, maybe they weren't before, but now they might be. <laughs> so try not to ask leading questions. Instead, just ask, you know, what are you thinking? Um, you know, what are you feeling anxious about? So that can open up the conversation and um, you can find out what's going on. Think things through with your child. Um, it's helpful to talk through and have a plan, um, you know, a lot of anxiety comes from the uncertainty of outcomes. And while we can't guarantee any outcomes, we can help the child plan. Um, we can help them, you know, go through different scenarios and come up with what they will do in different scenarios. And just having that plan is very helpful um, for children with anxiety. Along those lines, express positive and realistic expectations. Again, we can't guarantee an outcome. Um, we can't guarantee, you know, if they're anxious about a test, that they're not going to do well. Well, we can't guarantee that they're going to ace the test. Um, but again, we can help them to come up with strategies to manage their anxiety and also a plan for how they will you know, do well on that test. And lastly, it's important to model healthy ways of handling anxiety. Um, so previously, you know, I asked you to kind of think about something you did before when you were feeling anxious and how you managed through that anxiety. So think about that. Was that, you know, a healthy coping mechanism? And is that something you could, you know, help your child with? So it's important that you're also modeling these healthy ways um, to handle anxiety because they're looking to you um, and they're seeing what you do. And so that's also very important. A few more strategies. Um, it's helpful to put distance between anxiety and the child. So a few ways to do this are worry time and jotting down worries. So worry time is a specific time that you set aside. Um, and that's the time for your child to worry, but they're just not gonna sit down and worry, right? That's not super helpful for them to just sit there and just worry. Um, a big part of it is they will think about what it is that's causing them their anxiety and they'll start coming up with possible solutions um, or they'll co start coming up with possible strategies. That's key. We don't just want them to sit and worry and you know, that's not as helpful. So we want them to start coming up with what they're going to do about that anxiety as well. And if they are worried, it's kind of funny, but if they're worried that they're not going to remember their worries, um, during that worry time, you can have them jot them down. So throughout the day, if they start feeling anxious about something and they're, you know, they want to think about it later during their worry time and start kind of thinking of possible solutions, they can just kind of jot that down real quick, put it out of their mind, and then come back to it during their worry time. Um, another thing that you can do is exercise. This is good for everything, right? Um, it does decrease stress hormones. Uh, it redirects your thoughts to the present moment. When students are feeling anxious, sometimes they're caught up in the, what's gonna happen? What if this, what if that? Um, and when they're exercising, it kind of brings them back to the present. It provides a buffer against future stress. You know, studies have shown that those who get more exercise are less affected by stress. And lastly, focus on your child's strengths. Um, you know, this is really helpful. Talk about and build up their strengths. This helps build their confidence. They can, they'll start feeling strong and capable, and it'll really help them to be able to start working through some of that anxiety. So another quick thought exercise. Think about your child and or your student, um, depending on who you are here, and just list in your head two to three of their strengths that you could help them really focus on and to start building their confidence. So when should you see a counselor? 
if you're worried about your child's anxiety, when is it you know, an appropriate time to see a counselor? Well, if you have any questions, um, you can definitely always reach out to a counselor and ask what they think. But if the anxiety is starting to impact your child's life, um, if it's impacting their ability to learn, to make friends, or to have fun with their friends, uh, if it's impacting them in the family, then that's definitely a good time to see a counselor. Um, your school counselor is a great place to start. Depending on um, the severity or the amount of support your child needs, you may need to get outside um, help, an outside therapist, and the school counselor can also help you locate those resources. So there's two main categories of counseling strategies that have shown to be effective um, in treating anxiety or in helping a child manage anxiety. Um, and I'm gonna explain this a little bit more in the next slides, but cognitive behavioral therapy um, is one and the other is mindfulness-based um, stress reduction. And either technique or theory that you use, small groups um, can be really helpful for students with anxiety. One, it's a very, it's an efficient way um, for the counselor to teach coping strategies because they're working with more than one student at a time. So it's great for that. It just helps normalize the experience for the student. And they know they're not the only one um, going through that and the only one with these feelings and thoughts. And for students with social anxiety, it's a really great way um, for them to practice social skills in a graduated way before you know they're practicing those skills in a larger group. So it's really great for that. I'm gonna take a quick break. So CBT, um, the theory behind CBT is that our thoughts affect our behaviors, affect our emotions. It's a cycle. They all affect each other. As you can see, the arrows go both ways. Um, so anxiety is the emotion that we're looking at here. So what can we do to help anxiety? We have interventions that target the thoughts or target the behaviors. Um, and through that, we aim to help manage the anxiety. So one of these that's really fun um, for younger students, one of my favorite things to do, I've, every time I've done it, like the students have loved it, um, it's been a huge success, is the worry monster. So what you do in the worry monster is you want them to take those thoughts, those anxious thoughts, um, and they're going to create like a character, a monster, right? And they're the ones who are saying these thoughts and giving them these kind of anxious thoughts. So they can draw it, they can, you know, make it with whatever materials you have laying around. You can get creative as you want, um, but it's super fun and it helps the child talk about it in a way that's more objective because it externalizes the anxiety. And it also really helps empower the children because they can start talking back to the anxiety. They think it's really fun to boss back the anxiety. And when they're having the thoughts and they're in their head, um, they, you know, they might, they might be able to tell you what they're thinking, but it's hard sometimes for them to combat those thoughts. When they have this external worry monster, you know, saying these things like, oh, you know, this shot's gonna hurt, you know, your parents are gonna come back. Um, when they get to boss it back, they think that's really fun. And they're able to come up with really creative things to say, and they're really able to challenge those thoughts in ways that will surprise you. Um, sometimes at first, you might have to get them going a little bit and give them, you know, a couple suggestions, but from what I've seen after that, they run with it, you know, and they're really able to start challenging those thoughts, which is a hard skill. And so that one's really great. Um, and then similarly, thought checking, which works a little better for older students um, because they are starting to be able to express those thoughts a little bit more and then have the ability to really challenge that and look at it a little bit more objectively. Um, so they can take their anxious thought and start thinking about, you know, the facts and what is my evidence for thinking this? What's happened in the past? What else might happen? Um, what's a different possible explanation? And when they put it in perspective, you know, questions such as, what's the worst thing that could happen? Um, and how likely is that to happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And then what's most, most likely to happen? This just really helps them start um, to put it in perspective and get a little more balanced thoughts, um, a little more, you know, realistic thoughts. So 
that's really helpful. But it is, it does take the older student who can, who can just kind of verbalize those thoughts and start um, challenging them that works best with them. So both of those were um, targeting the thoughts, the thought piece of that triangle, the CBT triangle. For behaviors, um, we can do role plays. The, all of these skills, everything we're going to talk about tonight, um, just like any skill in life, practice is key. When a student is in a very anxious state, um, it's going to be hard to use any of these strategies if they haven't practiced them previously. You almost want them to become second nature and things that they're just able to do. Um, so you want to practice beforehand. And you can do this through scenarios where you're acting them out with the students. This is great in groups. Um, you can model, so you can, you know, give the scenario, but maybe if the student doesn't know what to do, you can model some possibilities, and then they can also, they can follow up with those. And using puppets, again, for the younger students, using puppets is great. Um, it's just sometimes easier for them to use puppets or an external character to start, like, acting some of these things out and thinking through some of these. So those are some different poss possible ways that you can role play. And the second main category um, that's effective in treating um, anxiety is mindfulness-based stress reduction. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard the word mindfulness. It's, you know, becoming more popular and kind of growing right now. Um, and I'm super excited about that because I think it's great. I love mindfulness. Um, mindfulness is just, it's based on awareness of the present moment. And what I love about mindfulness is it's, not hard to do. Um, it's just thinking about doing it. Um, I have some apps here. So if you want to check out some of these apps, these are great for kids. Um, they all do have a free version. I believe some of them have a paid version. I use Smiling Mind um, myself, but they're great. They have different breathing exercises, um, different guided meditations. You can set up profiles, goals, um, all of that. So it's a great way to start developing those um, practices of mindfulness. So the very basic place to start with mindfulness is breathing. Um, and when you have a younger child, you can start with very, you know, imagery is really good. So you can have, you know, breathe in, we have pretend you're smelling a flower, you know, so that's something they can they know what that means. Um, breathe out, pretend you're blowing a leaf. They understand that. Um, so you wanna use language that they understand. As they get older, you can make it a little more um, complex. It doesn't need to be too complex because it is just deep breathing. Um, but another good one is hand breathing. So if you all wouldn't mind, we're gonna try this one together. Um, so just put your hand up and we're going to breathe in as we go trace our fingers up and then breathe out as we go down. So we're going to breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. And breathe in and out. And I don't know about you, but I feel a little bit calmer after doing my um, hand breathing. But I love breathing exercises because no matter where you are, you can always do these. Um, so you don't have to have anything except your body. It's easy to do. It's very effective. Um, so breathing exercises, love breathing exercises. Um, grounding techniques are another way that you can help the student kind of get back to the present moment. Um, when they're getting wrapped up in those anxious thoughts, these can bring them back to the present. Um, there's the senses grounding. Sometimes with students, I take off the last one, the things you can taste because it just kind of confuses them. They're like, should I eat something? Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to taste, you know. So I just kind of leave that one off and do the four things you can see, three you can feel, um, two you can hear, and one you can smell. Alphabet grounding, they, the student will look around the room um, and try to find something that starts with each letter of the alphabet. You know, it's as ba basic as that. It can be something that they see. It can be something that they hear, um, something that they smell, just anything in the room around them um, for the alphabet grounding. Guided mental relaxations um, are another great way to bring the student back to the present. And depending on what the um, 
the guided relaxation is, there's so many out there. Um, I'll talk about mindful moments in a little bit that we do at Hill, but they can be about, you know, gratitude. Okay, I apologize. My computer decided to stop showing the presentation. Glennis, I can see you. Do you see the presentation still? You do see it still? I see it, but it's in the regular format, not in okay. the presenter format. Okay, mine's is loading, I'm not sure. Okay, we might be getting there. There it goes. All right, let me try to, there we go. All right, we're, we're back. back. Sorry about that. Um, but so we've got a mental relaxation. So there's several links here to some different scripts um, that you can use for that. Um, progressive muscle relaxation is another great one. You know, essentially you are, as soon as, tensing their muscle groups um, and then relaxing them. Again, this isn't something that's necessarily um, easy for younger students to do. So I really like the script that's on here. I know it's small, you can't see everything that it says, but it gives very tangible um, descriptions that younger students understand, such as cheeks. You know, it says puff your cheeks out as far as you can. Um, I think for mouth, it's just, you know, pretend you're chewing gum. So it's things that they understand. So it's a very good way to get students to do the progressive muscle relaxation. All right. Now what can teachers do um, in the classrooms if they have anxious students? Um, one thing is they can challenge their thoughts. Um, you know, if the student is able to express those thoughts, the teacher can help challenge them through that thought checking we were talking about earlier. Um, the teachers can also mo model positive self-talk. Um, mindfulness exercises, these don't have to take long. Um, as we saw, breathing exercises don't take very long. Um, we do what we call a mindful moment at Hill. Um, it doesn't work quite the same in the virtual environment, but when we were on campus every day after, you know, recess, when, you know, students tend to get, you know, wound up, we would play a, about like a two minute or less mindfulness script, um, we'd get over the intercom and read that, and that just helped, you know, kind of bring them back into focus and get them ready for class. So it doesn't have to be something that takes long. Um, access to calm corners um, or calm toolkits. A counselor can help you help set this up if it's something that would work in your school. But these, this can be a really cool, um, you can set up a area in your classroom or it can just be somewhere in the school. And it's a place where a student can go if they're feeling um, particularly anxious. They can go to the corner, there can be, you know, you can set up music, you can set up, you know, coloring books, stress, you know, fidgets, all of that sort of thing. Um, you know, cards with different mindfulness exercises or breathing techniques, so that they just have some different tools that they can use to help calm down. Um, another thing that's helpful in the classroom is having you know, movement breaks or activities requiring movement, especially for the younger students. You also may have to have some accommodations if you have, you know, an anxious student. So an exit plan to a safe space if they're just feeling really anxious and need to get away. Um, and this could be, you know, going to see the counselor. It could be one of those calm corners. Identifying changes in routine in, in advance. Um, so typically you may have, you know, a schedule posted in your classroom for what happens every day. Um, but if there's going to be something that is going to disrupt that or a change in routine, it's helpful to let that student know in advance.
All right, lastly here, I have some um, resources. So, you know, throughout the presentation, there was also some resources and different websites that you can um, look at. But here, there's a couple of books. Um, these are more geared towards parents with anxious students, um, anxious children. And then a few websites, SEL Sketches is really cool. Um, it has some great videos and activities that your child can watch. Um, it does actually could be used by counselors, parents, or teachers. Um, but it's good videos for students just to help explain anxiety, what exactly it is, um, and give them some different uh, tools and strategies and um, prompts that they can go through. And then the Child Mind Institute and Kids Health are great websites for parents um, to give a little more information on anxiety in children. All right, and I will, I thank you, and I will turn it over um, to Glennis. Thanks, Christina. So you might ask yourself, why did we separate teens and the older group of students to work with and discuss tonight? Because some of the things you hear will be very similar, but I think the main reason we decided to separate these groups out is because teens and older students can be very self-aware of their thoughts and feelings, and you can actually have a discussion with teens, a conversation. Yes, you can. We can have a discussion with each other. You can check in with a teen. You can suggest to a teen that they can have control over their choices and how to handle their anxiety. So throughout my presentation, similar to Christina, we'll take a moment sometimes to do some of the anxiety breaks and think about what we can do to challenge our thoughts. So the American Psychological Association definition makes a clear distinction between anxiety and anxiety disorder. And I think this is particularly important to discuss with you when we're particularly thinking about teens. The main emphasis is that for anxiety disorder is the, can create an avoidance of a situation, a feeling of loss of control, where anxiety itself is a discomfort in a situation feeling anxious. So the emphasis here is on that anxiety can allow us to deal with a tense situation. For example, presenters or performers often say that a heightened anxiety before going on stage gives them the adrenaline to perform well. So we do want that state of anxious feeling, we just don't want it to come into an uncontrolled sense. One of the things we noticed too, and Christina touched upon this a little bit, is that anxiety and comorbidity for certain disorders. So comorbidity is having one or more conditions at the same time. The importance though here is that these disorders are comorbid and that having one of these disorders may increase the likelihood of having another of these disorders, such as the ADHD. Why would that be the case? Well, for one thing, if you think about sometimes having ADHD, students who have ADHD, they often get feedback all the time, um, negative feedback quite frequently on things that maybe they've done in the classroom. A lot of times students will start their day off saying, I'm gonna have a good day today. And before they can get going, they've been corrected several times. And often, the feedback isn't directed towards the behavior that they know they've actually performed at that time. So you can see the nature of having an increased anxiety over, am I going to get in trouble today? Is something bad going to happen? Learning differences, we know that students with learning differences often have difficulty processing information in reading and writing and even in social performances. So why would that create anxiety? Well, you need a chance to process the information of what the teacher is asking you. Sometimes teachers call on students unexpectedly, and that creates a sense of anxiety because the student has not had a chance to process the information. Sometimes students have also told us one of the worst things that happened to them is to get an A on an assignment or on a test because then they're expected to get that A every single day and that increases their feelings, <clears throat> excuse me, of anxiety. 
The physical conditions that go along with it, the phobias or panic attacks are definitely part of the anxiety disorder. We see anxiety and depression, substance abuse, and certainly some of the mood disorders such as bipolar disorder and a true full-blown anxiety disorder. So again, take 10 quick seconds and think of a time that you felt anxious. And I want you to think about that time, name the time and describe the feeling. 10 quick seconds. <clears throat> okay, so why did I say 10 seconds? Because you probably could recall quickly a time that you felt anxious. Perhaps it, you didn't feel out of control, but you felt uncomfortable, right? Well, knowing that we all have that feeling that this is a way of life is very important. What we want to emphasize is not that the feeling happens, that it's okay, but we also want to focus on the response to that feeling. We want to abandon unrealistic expectations, and we want to expect what I call expect a do-over. It's not going to be the last time that you get to take a test. Uh-oh. Not going to be the last time you get a quiz. It's not going to be the last time that you get to sing a song in front of people. Not the last time you're going to act in a play. Whatever it is, think of it as you're probably going to get a do-over. And doing that, that takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it? So back to anxiety disorder then. So why are we concerned about anxiety versus anxiety disorder? Well, one, we really want you to know that especially with teens and students that are older, that anxiety disorder is interfering with daily functioning. It's often described as unexplained. People will sometimes say that they describe it as a strong feeling that came out of nowhere. When this happens, this is the time that perhaps you need to talk that situation over with the teen, maybe reach out and seek a professional's help, a counselor's help, talking it through with someone. Medications might be used in this case in order to help someone focus and learn strategies and decrease that amount of anxiety. One of the techniques that Christina mentioned was the cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the reasons we like to use that, particularly with teens, is because you can get them to identify and challenge negative thoughts. So for example, you could say, the person is thinking to themselves, I'm going to panic. How do you challenge that thought? You can say, have I panicked in this situation before? Highly unlikely I will do it again if I've never panicked in, in the first place. So you might say, if I've never panicked, it's highly unlikely that I'm going to do it this time. Another technique that's often used with anxiety is exposure therapy. This is a graduated exposure through thoughts or real scenarios of what you might fear. We know that fear often is that sense of fight or flight, we've got to get away from this. So a therapist, or, or once you learn this technique, this is something you might walk through. So for instance, if there's a fear of school, someone might start by looking at a yearbook of a school, um, driving by the school, talking to someone about the school, walking up to the school by themselves, walking up to the school with a friend, walking up to the school when no one's there, walking up to the school when lots of people are there, or touring the school. So that's a way to have <clears throat> exposure to the situation that's increasing the anxiety. So what to look for and understand if someone is experiencing anxiety? You want to think about, is it, is it a causing an issue to daily functioning? And the way you can get at that and the severity of those emotions is just to ask a few check-in questions. You might ask, how often do you feel anxious when doing this activity? Do you experience any physical symptoms? What kind and how often? The other thing that's helpful when thinking about anxiety is reframing anxiety. We really want to start to think about these feelings as a graduated response. If we, we don't generally start at the top of these feelings, we usually progress to these reactions. And understanding this can help us control our thoughts and feelings. So let's think about changing the words or reframing activities. How can you do that? You might want to choose different words. So instead of starting with, I'm very anxious or I have anxiety, you would start with, 
I feel uncomfortable in this situation or I'm experiencing some discomfort. What about stress? Stress is another word we can throw around, but sometimes we always sense that stress is a bad thing. But remember, there is healthy stress. Healthy stress is our body's response to feeling excited, motivated to succeed or get creative. It's the equivalent of, well, when we had paper of saying, the dog ate my homework. You had to get creative, right? In that stressful situation, you had to think, how do I get my teacher off my back or whatever the situation is? Or my favorite, grabbing a chocolate bar. Sometimes there are stress-related physical reactions such as sweaty palms or butterflies in your stomach or your hands start to shake. These are your body reactions and basically are telling you that you want to have a ready response, like going back to grabbing that chocolate bar. Just kidding, we wanna make sure we're eating healthy. Sometimes when students come to see me, I often will say to them, have you had something to eat? And if so, what did you have to eat? Because maybe that nervous stomach could be a response to not eating or not eating something healthy. So again, remember, feeling anxious is a feeling of unease or concern. So anxiety versus anxiety disorder. Anxiety is the increased feeling of all of the above and can allow you to improve your performance. Whereas anxiety disorder or having a full on panic attack interferes with performance. So let's do this, this activity along with me. One of the things you can start doing is self-talk. And I know Christina mentioned modeling. So for adults in the room, you might wanna model this behavior. So let's try this. Think of a time again, when you might've felt anxious and what can you say? Well, first you might name the issue. I'm feeling nervous about this important job interview. If Beth Anderson is on the call, this is just all made up, okay? <laughs> so I'm feeling nervous about this important job interview. Describe the feeling. Oh, it kind of feels like butterflies in my stomach. So what will I try? Taking some deep breaths, refocusing, reminding myself I am prepared, and then even thinking about the outcome. Well, I started off nervous, but once I got into it, I felt better. Maybe that lavender aroma did help after all. So if you think about that, think of an activity, walk yourself through it, name the issue, and think about the positive outcome. So other strategies you can think about. One of the things that's really important is to always have a plan. And as Christina mentioned over and over again, we really have to think about practicing that plan, be on the ready for that plan. By doing that, we can think about what we can and cannot control. We can draw on past knowledge. Well, that's probably the area that has affected students and us the most during the pandemic, right? Is drawing on past knowledge. Because we might say to ourselves, but we didn't have any past knowledge when it came to the pandemic. But we did have other stressful times that we had to work through or come up with a plan. So again, not focusing on the pandemic here or some of the other activities that we've all experienced in 2020 and a little bit since then. But we do, I do get asked often about this particular one that parents tell me or students even tell me and teachers that's causing anxiety for students. It's the being on the camera question. What can I do? I'm always asked about, oh, I really feel anxious about being on the camera. Well, this circles back to being able to talk with someone and a teen about asking certain questions. First of all, we need to determine what is it about being on the camera? If it's looking at yourself, one of the coolest things you could do is just take a cute little post-it note and stick it right over your face on that camera. Then you don't have to worry about looking at yourself all the time. But maybe it's not really looking at you. You might think you look pretty groovy, right? Don't you like that word, pretty groovy? Anyhow, you decide it's the looking at others that's a problem. Same thing works. Take a couple of little sheets of paper, little post-it notes, little cute characters, put them over those faces, and then you don't have to worry about looking at them the entire class time. Maybe it's just camera fatigue. You can ask for a camera break, and a good technique is for teachers to even offer a camera break. Maybe it's just pinning the speaker, so the only person you're focusing on is the speaker. And sometimes this is going to take trial and error, and that's okay. That's what we have to do is practice and plan through it. 
So let's go ahead and focus though more on these strategies that we can know that are similar to things that we can do during situations where we're feeling anxious. Remember, not all strategies work for everyone. So going back to it's important to practice and think about what plan will work for you. You may need to try and practice and yes, do this more than one time before you're certain that it's working. You may try several ideas for different situations. For instance, aromatherapy might help you at home, probably not so much in the classroom, but you could have a focal point in the classroom that you look at that makes you feel positive or takes you to thinking about your plan. One of the things that you can do is have a lot of acronyms that can work for you, and I'm going to discuss that in later slides. You want to have that go-to person. Who's the person that's going to help remind you of the plan? You want to know who this person is ahead of time. You want to talk to that person ahead of time and have them help you with the plan. So they know if you come to them, if you're that person, you're going to help them find their quiet spot, be the listening ear. Maybe you're going to be the person to remind them of their plan. This is usually where a teacher can be very helpful because they can strongly suggest what to do in terms of the plan that has already been worked out. Choices at this time aren't very helpful usually because they can feel overwhelming. So just saying, this is your plan. This is what you decided to do can be very helpful. At this point, you're being that person's champion to walk them through their plan. You also want to have calming words available. Not everybody has the same calming word. Sometimes calm does work and sometimes it's an awful word. So you want to think about a word and, and sometimes it's good to have maybe even a funny word that's really something that you can find clever that works for you. Challenge your thoughts, as Christina talked about. We really want to think about the mindfulness, or as we like to say sometimes, take yourself to your happy place. You just need to know where that is. Could be the beach, some people, maybe not. Could be that you see yourself on an ATV racing through the woods, but whatever your happy place is, pull on that, use that to feel better. Humor is wonderful for challenging your thoughts and getting out of that anxious feeling. Have a funny video available. You know, there are tons of comedians out there, tons of funny YouTube videos, but you don't want to in the moment have to go scrolling through looking for those videos. So you want to have them on the ready. Know who your favorite comedian is and go for it. Refocus on what has worked also is very helpful. Another thing that's real important is to start to think about taking the weight off of some of the words that you use and try to change them into more uh, usage in your vocabulary. So instead of always saying, oh, I'm just so nervous, maybe what you actually are is pretty excited about getting on stage or performing or doing well on that test. Instead of saying I'm stressed, you might just say, well, you know what? I care a little bit about this or I care a lot about this situation and takes it away from that sense of stress. Maybe instead of upset, yes, I am concerned. So you're acknowledging your feelings without giving it so much weight, unless you already know that sometimes when you say stress, it's just the word and it's just stress. So here's a fun strategy to try. And I do challenge you to give this one a try for a couple of seconds here. If you've got a fun partner in your corner that you can do this with. I've never been able to get through it. And I suggest you just give it a try because laughter really does help take us out of our head. It is a proven mood enhancer. So all you have to do is look at the person and you say ha, and they are supposed to say ha back. And then you go ha ha until you go ha ha, until you're in a full blown laughter. And I can look over to Christina right now because Christina and I have yet to get past three ha ha's, okay? So find your laugh partner or find a way to create humor when you're feeling those anxious situations coming along. As Christina mentioned, the progressive muscle relaxation is really helpful. You can take this list, the sheet, have it in a place where you can refer to it to know exactly what to do, but you don't have to think about it. But the main thing is to know what it feels like. And two of the things sometimes I'll use with students is to tell them to clench their fists and then let it go slowly. 
because that contraction of the fist is what that feeling is when you think you're going to be anxious or you're feeling anxiety, but you slowly release, lets you know you're breathing through it. Another thing is to contract the stomach muscles and then to exhale and let those stomach muscles go. So that gives you a sense of what it feels like, so, but also something that you can do to control it, especially using breathing to do that. So here are some of the acronyms. Now, the challenge here sometimes is to try to remember, oh my goodness, what does RAIN really stand for so I can do all these things? But instead of doing that, you're basically just remembering the word. So you're remembering the word RAIN, but maybe out of RAIN, what might be really important for you is to remember that the R stands for recognize what's happening. So what are you saying there? You might say, Okay, I recognize this feeling because this is the feeling I always have right before a test, but I also get through it, okay? You almost think about think. Think is one of my favorites too, because you wanna think, do I need to react to this situation? Is it necessary to react to this situation this way? How much weight am I putting on this situation? And is it necessary for me to respond this way? And out of self, I like love because this is when we want to spend time with each other. This is when we want to get out of our heads and have fun with someone, maybe relax with someone, play a game. That person might remind us of our plan. This is when our social connections have been real important during all the incidences that we have come through. And that is, you know, maybe we did call someone up or send someone a text message or scream across the driveway, whatever work, that social connection, that being with that person and spending time with someone to get out of our heads is very helpful. And then there's relax, okay? And out of this one, I like to remember sleep, okay? Because we need sleep. Sleep repairs our bodies. Now, here's a real challenge. There are studies that are suggesting that cell phones are interfering with our sleep. Now, this shouldn't be an issue with teens, right? <laughs> well, actually, it's not an issue with any of us. None of us are attached to our phones. I mean, do we feel like Pavlov's dogs when we hear that little ding ding, we wanna run and see what's going on and check that message? Well, that is actually starting to interfere with our sleep if we don't stop looking at our cell phones early because that blue screen can create um, a dysfunction when it comes to thinking about trying to relax and to go to sleep. So one of the suggestions is that we walk away from that blue screen at least 30 minutes before we're trying to rest and go to sleep. That way we won't be tempted to look at our phones and we know through studies through the National Sleep Foundation that the screen, the blue screen, is actually restrains the production of melatonin, which we need that hormone that controls our sleep and wake cycle, which is otherwise known as the circadian rhythm. So again, stop checking at least 30 minutes before sleep time. And better still, this one's even harder, try putting the phone in another room altogether. Here's a simple one, feeling stressed, try the stop technique. And why is the stop technique kind of simple? Because it's the word itself. It just says stop, interrupt those thoughts you're having that you want to react to. And this is a cool little technique to do it. You stop, you take a breath, you observe what's going on, and then you're able to proceed. So my favorite anchor acronym that I do often with students is just breathe. Because sometimes when they walk in my office or if you think about yourself, do you sometimes feel like you're just holding your breath when it comes to feeling anxious and you're thinking, what can I do? I'm just feeling like, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't think. And I'm actually holding my breath. So breathe, be in the moment, take a moment to get out of your head and relax energize yourself think about how can i energize myself take action meaning put your plan into place tell someone because that's the person that might be able to help you halt and stop and refocus and most of all excel okay breathe exercise take that breath and excel 
So what are some things we can do? Here are some real comments from students and folks that have expressed some feelings of feeling anxious and what has happened. One is I want people to believe me. Well, how can we accommodate that? Well, first, we want to listen openly and respectfully. We don't want to judge. We want to reflect on what's being said. And a good question during that time might be, how have you handled that before? If you feel like that's not a good time to ask a question, it might feel like judging, then remind the person how they've handled that before. Another comment that I hear sometimes is, I'm having a hard time. So what am I going to do? An accommodation for that is remember to acknowledge that feeling that the person is telling you. Remind them of their plan. Does that include going for a walk together, doing mindfulness together, playing a game, reminding them of that funny video, and laughing? I need support. So I need support. There are apps. Christina mentioned some that I think can be very handy. And since we do usually have our cell phones with us, that might be a good time to pull that cell phone out and use one of those apps to help. Or talk to a parent, talk to a counselor, have a buddy person at hand that you might need to talk to. That's a good way to find support. I need to know I'm not alone. This one's real important because often, especially teens will say, I must be the only one that feels anxious. And you're not the only one that feels anxious. So if you're that person that being, you're being that champion to that person and they're telling you that they feel alone, you wanna validate those feelings, but you don't wanna commiserate with those feelings. In other words, you don't wanna say, oh, I know what you mean. I'm so stressed myself. I was really anxious, Ooh, I, you know, and make it all about you. But you do want to say, I hear that you're feeling upset at this time. I hear that you're concerned. What is it that usually helps? I understand that others often feel this way. And usually I know that people have a plan or something that helps. So it validates those feelings without commiserating with those feelings. I like this quote because one of the things it tells us is exactly what we've been talking about this evening. If you want to conquer the anxiety of life, live in the moment, live in the breath. Those two things that we've been emphasizing, living in the moment, getting out of your head instead of projecting about what could happen, what could have auto might, maybe, possibly, all those things that come along with anxiety and taking a deep breath and breathing. We know that anxiety is associated with fear and folks often talk about fear. One of my favorite quotes is by Nelson Mandela. And Nelson was, in case you don't know, he was a former president of South Africa. And he often quoted that, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. I like that quote because, again, it doesn't say this isn't a feeling, that you aren't ever going to feel afraid and upset or fearful about anything, but it does say to challenge that fear and think of ways you can conquer it. Another one of my favorite quotes, I'm a big quote person. If we were on campus and you came to my office, there are quotes all over my office. There are quotes all over my house. It's just my thing. It helps us remind us of these kinds of things that we want to focus on. So another one of my favorites is Isabel Allende. She's a Chilean writer. And she says, fear is inevitable. I have to accept that, but I cannot allow it to paralyze me. So again, how can I keep it from paralyzing me? I need to think of a plan. I need to have a strategy. I need to be able to breathe through it. So here are some favorite resources of most teens. That calm one keeps showing up quite a bit. It works for a lot of folks. I even noticed they're putting it on commercials now, which is kind of cool. So there is a free version of calm as well as a paid premium version. There's also mind shift. The reason why I like mind shift is because it actually walks you through some of the strategies that we just talked about. So you don't even have to worry about trying to remember, what do I do first? Do I stop and do I breathe? Do I exercise? Do I exhale? It actually takes you uh, right through those different concepts. The other thing, there's another two that I want to mention that's not up here, but teens find very helpful. 
One is called San Velo, which is S-A-N-V as in Victor, E-L-L-O. And another, it's just another app that helps walk you through relaxing and the mindfulness strategies. And then another one is Breathe to Relax, gives you that kind of like calm, that sense of breathing through a situation and calming yourself. Here's some books that I find helpful. The first book is What to Do When You Worry Too Much. Is actually the targeted audience for that are younger students. But what really is helpful is I've actually used that with some teens to say, let's look at what some strategies are, like having a worry space and going to that space. You can only worry in this particular space. Or you can jot down your ideas or think about what you're going to do in that worry space. So that's one of the suggestions in there that can work across the board no matter how old you are. Mindfulness for teens in 10 minutes a day can be really helpful because they're just quick strategies, things that you can put aside or pull on anytime that you feel the need to. The websites that are very helpful, especially for parents, if you want to download the mental health newsletter, they often have tips almost like every month about something to do with anxiety or any kind of other uh, social emotional concern that you might want to think of tips and strategies to use. And then one of my favorites lately is Born This Way Foundation created by Lady Gaga and her family because of all the teens that she encountered, her own feelings of folks feeling like they're the only one in the world having anxiety or any other mental health concerns. So it's very helpful to know that here's a resource that you can go to or a website to find support. So thank you, that ends my part of the presentation. But I do wanna tell you about some exciting upcoming events happening at Hill. We do have the Monty happening on February 25th. This is our community fundraiser that supports the Wendy B. Spears Student Financial Aid Fund. And you can make any gift of any kind and join us for an inspiring evening of storytelling. I had the chance to sit through a Monty for our 40th anniversary at um, Hill. And they're really exciting stories. And our own Brian Brander is part of that. So please join us. And then also coming up next for the Community Education Series event is the topic of resilience, which I think follows pretty well a past going thinking about anxiety and the next step. This one will be April 14th. So be sure to look forward to Amanda Morin, who's a speaker, author, podcast host, and she's part of understood.org as a house advisor for them. And she will have some really good information on resilience. So thank you. And we are open to questions. All right. Thank you, Glennis and Christina. This was really, really excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we did get some really great questions. Um, I wanted to start with one. Um, you all talked so much about um, coping mechanisms, whether it's, you know, finger breathing or whether it's using one of the, you know, having a plan or a, a worry space or a worry time. How do you approach students who refuse to use coping mechanisms. I mean, sometimes just out and out say, just let me be miserable. How, how do you handle that in that moment? So with older students, um, you know, for one thing, as I said, we want to make sure that teens have a chance to feel like they have a choice in what they're doing at the same time of being self-aware about their thoughts and feelings. So instead of telling them a coping mechanism, you can ask them, again, that simple question of, well, what works for you? And find out what that might be for them. And sometimes it's more of a question than looking for an answer. So I think that's what's important because we're the person asking the question and we think that that person's going to just tell us, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And they may not, but we can present that information. We can present some ideas and let there be choice in it. Thank you. The um, a question that, that kind of relates to that, um, sometimes anxiety presents as outwardly as anger. Um, it could be, you know, directed at an adult or directed at an assignment a student is asked to do. 
Um, and, and that proves to be a difficult time sometimes when anger is presenting to try some of these coping mechanisms as well. Um, and, and students can actually escalate to try to keep you at a distance. So what suggestions do you have when a child is in that mode? It's tough. Um, I would say that's, you know, where we were speaking to practicing beforehand, because when you are escalated, that definitely you, you don't have the, you know, mental wherewithal to, okay, I need to stop and breathe. Like that's not gonna happen when you are escalated. Um, so as Glenna said, you may have to be the one to remind them, you know, if you've worked with them previously, you know their plan, you're their safe person, or, you know, you've worked with a teacher, they're in that situation. Um, so you may have to remind them, now it's time to breathe, or, you know, now it's time to do this activity. Um, but because it is really hard um, when a student is escalated to, you know, take that on themselves and think, oh, okay, I'm escalated, I need to calm down, I need to breathe. So you may, they may need that outside intervention, someone to say, okay, let's stop and breathe, uh, you know, let's take a walk to your calm space or, you know, just something to kind of remove them from that situation. Okay, so you're really just kind of giving them a, a time period to get to where they can, they can handle some of those coping mechanisms. And I think um, another thing yeah. that's really helpful during that situation is acknowledging the feeling, acknowledging that, you know, I, I hear you and I recognize your feeling and here's what I suggest that you do and so they can get out of their head again and use those strategies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. So um, it, it can be so many things these days, but outside of the pandemic, do you all in your experience have a sense of what are the most common causes of anxiety in elementary age kids? Um, and and I, you know, I guess it's more sort of, you know, where, where does that come from? Go ahead, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I would say in the younger students, I see a lot of anxiety around friendships, um, especially when they get to like, let's say like third grade, it really starts ramping up a little bit. Um, so a lot of anxiety around friendships and, um, and homework. Homework's always big too. I'd say those are the two things that I see most often, but friendships, I think is probably number one. Yeah, that social aspect and needing to belong when that goes wrong. Um, you also mentioned assignments and someone had a really great question and I, I figure as the Hill Center, we're pretty poised to answer it. Um, any specific suggestions for students whose anxiety seems to be triggered by assignments that require writing? Wow, that's a good question. And when you say, I know you have it in the chat, so it makes it a little difficult to answer, but requiring writing, and is it the act of writing? Is it the process of writing? Because sometimes at Hill, we will see students who, because their thoughts are coming so rapidly, they can't get from their thoughts mm -hmm. onto the paper. So that's a different strategy. So that strategy may be just blurting it all out to someone else who's writing it down and describing all those thoughts that they have or blurting it out voice to text and getting all those thoughts so they don't have to worry about trying to write and be perfect and how it looks or just getting it down on paper without correcting it right away and feeling like it needs to be corrected right away. So that's some of the strategies that go along with that. Mm -hmm. But also if it's just maybe the act of writing itself in terms of okay, I've got my thoughts. It's not that they're just coming too quickly. I just don't like to write. So then that becomes thinking about things like graphic organizers so it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Like, here's your plan. This is how you get ready to approach your writing assignment. You're going to use a plan. You're going to use a graphic organizer. You're going to use this technique that will work for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, they, writing is, um, it, the act of it itself um, can be difficult if handwriting or if, you know, if, if you're not that adept at it yet and you get a lot of negative feedback about writing or you feel like I'm always wrong when it comes to writing or that process of coming up with ideas. Sometimes that's a non-starter for kids. But I like the idea of sort of breaking it down and figuring out exactly what piece is the issue and, and starting there with something to assist and get them over that hump. Um, I think that's a great idea. Glynis, you had some great acronyms you shared during your segment. Would those be 
approachable for younger kids? Um, I, I know you were presenting it as teens, but could I use some of those if I have younger kids that are that are anxious? Oh, certainly. I use breathe with everyone <laughs> because I really think we need to breathe. I mean, that's the, the main thing. Let it go. Um, let our breath go and, and just take a deep breath in, a deep breath out. So, mm -hmm. And it reminds us to halt those thoughts that we might have that are interfering with what we need to do. I also, for whatever reason, like rain because I think when we think of rain, we feel like something's raining down on us, but rain's good. It cleanses our thoughts, right? It cleans things up. It makes the environment environment smell better sometimes, but I, I do like the rain one too because it reminds us um, to recognize what's happening and to stop and just know that we're going to move through this feeling. Yeah, that there's an end. Yeah, it won't always feel like that. Um, another the more specific one um, where a, a child, um, it manifests as stomach aches when they have to be up in front of a group of people. Christine, you want to take that one since it's a child or, and then I can piggyback. For yeah, it's people. a question just like how, what would you do if the child is getting stomach aches? Okay. Exactly. Um, so, you know, if I think a lot of actually what Glennis talked about in hers um, could be applied as well. And in the reframing, you know, it's when you have to get up in front of a classroom, it's normal to be nervous. That's a normal feeling like the butterflies in your stomach. That's, you know, that's expected almost, you know, it's not necessarily their nervousness and excitedness are very similar physiologically, right? Um, so those butterflies in their stomach, it's a very normal reaction. Um, so, you know, just kind of letting them know that and that can help just feeling that, okay, this is a normal feeling. It's, you know, okay, if I get these butterflies in my stomach um, and, you know, just kind of teaching them some breathing techniques and, you know, to be in the moment. And then, you know, once they hopefully, you know, get up in front of the classroom and start, it does kind of ease a little bit. So I think just kind of emphasizing the normality of, you know, that those feelings. And using that anxiety to perform better or feel better about your performance, because it's just like, oh, this excitement will get me through this thing that I need to do that doesn't feel so good right now, but it will be exciting to get through it and to start talking to someone. Sometimes I'll suggest to students too, especially older students, that they use a focal point, um, a color in the room, uh, somebody at the top of someone's head, so they aren't really looking right at that person. Something in their pocket, you know, a pen in their pocket sometimes can be helpful. Not an ink pen that'll burst, but something, <laughs> you know, they can hold on to that feels good. But those are kinds of tangible things that can help too. And I think something actually that Glennis just said that made me think of something else is again, yeah, maybe even point out a time they've had to, you know, they've been in that situation before and how did they feel afterwards? Because I can almost guarantee they felt proud of themselves after they, you know, got up and spoke in front of the class. So focusing on that positive feeling of, oh, I was really proud of myself. Um, you know, that can help as well. Absolutely. Um, one of the things, I'll, I'll just add another, one of the things that I used to do when I was a fourth grade teacher, I had kids that just really, that was a true fear and, and certainly is for a lot of folks to have to speak in front of a group. And so I just made it a class rule that if you wanted, you could bring a buddy to come up and stand beside you. And, and so it's still, you know, you're getting through what it is you needed to get through and following through on the assignment, but you've sort of got a little moral support um, you know, up there with you. So um, that's, that's another way to go about it as well. Um, uh, Christina, on slide seven, there was a, a statement on the, um, there were sort of a, a list of 10 things that were written out. And one of the things it mentioned was sort of giving up that idea of mental health days or coming and sleeping with mom. Um, and it was really framed, I think, in a way that's important to point out because all of us, you know, have needed a mental health day from time to time. So I think the point that it was making might have been that it, it becomes an avoidance. And talk a little bit about why you'd want to avoid avoidance. <laughs> right. And I, I didn't actually love that they said, uh, use the phrase, give up the idea of a mental health day, because right. I think a mental health day is a good thing. Right. Um, so I don't love their phrasing on that particular aspect, but they do go on to say, yes, yeah, skip days or sleep with mom nights. Um, cause it's, if you're feeling really anxious about something, you know, say that you have a child who just is really afraid of the dark, you know, doesn't want to sleep in their room. Um, if you do give them those days, those avoidance days, well, okay, you can sleep with mom tonight. You're almost reinforcing the fear 
um, you know, it's, it's almost giving them the message, well, maybe there is something to be afraid of if mom is like letting me sleep in her room, you know, or is mom's letting me do this, she's letting me leave that situation. So it just reinforces that fear a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's important instead to come up with, you know, the healthy strategies or, you know, a very progressive as, you know, Glennis had her example, but, you know, it can be a progressive thing. Like, okay, tonight you are going to sleep in your room with the light on, um, you know, we'll do that for a week. You know, after that, you'll sleep in your room with the night light. Um, you know, after that, we'll sleep in your room with, you know, in the dark. So it can be very progressive, but they do need to learn how to manage the situation. Just mm -hmm. letting them avoid it isn't going to help, you know, them build that, those skills. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I actually think that was our last and our last question, it's really funny. Okay, somebody asked a question. It was the very first one that came up, and now they're saying, never mind. But are you all familiar with dialectical behavior therapy? So much, Glennis, you almost touched on it when you put that quote up about living in the moment. And so people were wondering, is that appropriate for um, when anxiety is present in children? Is that a appropriate therapy? From I, I have limited understanding of it, so Glennis may be able to speak better to it, okay. but my understanding it's more for older students. Most definitely, because there's a lot of talking through it and self-awareness and, you know, it can be very powerful, but, you know, you have to have a sense of self-awareness and the ability to process thoughts and feelings. There are ways to do that, too, with younger kids, but you're really getting more then into some deeper kinds of different counseling, um, such as the play therapy techniques and things like that, that really would be very different from your DBT. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, two questions, interestingly enough, that have just popped in, and I'm gonna kind of combine the two because both of them talk a little bit about perfectionism. Um, so when um, anxiety reactions occur because they have received corrections, or um, they talk in a very low voice because they're afraid that they will be wrong. So it's, it's about taking risks and, uh, you know, understanding we all make mistakes kind of thing, but it, it's, it causes that reaction in them just to sort of it, it shut down. Do you want to jump in, Glennis, or do you want me to? <laughs> okay, Christina, for a younger student first, so. <laughs> Um, perfectionism is hard. Um, it's definitely something that I personally have struggled with, you know, my whole life. It's, it's a challenge. You, you, um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, it, it's hard, but I think part of it is trying to figure out where that's coming from, um, you know, and understanding why they feel the need to be perfect. You know, why are they worried about making mistakes? I think we do a really good job at Hill of promoting the growth mindset. Um, and I think that really, that helps with that perfectionism. You know, it's okay. It's, it's more than okay to make a mistake. It shows that you're trying. It shows that you are growing, you are learning. Um, so I think really emphasizing the growth mindset is key to helping with that perfectionism. Yeah. So Christina um, stole my answer about growth <laughs> mindset. <laughs> and she knows that I often like to get the students and everybody around Hill using that phrase, it's not something I've learned to do yet. So that once you get in the idea of thinking about yet, that something's to come, something you're going to practice, something you might fail at on occasion, but it's yet to come, that it makes it feel better to approach it. I also suggest sometimes that we take a chance um, at risk, some risk-taking behavior. You know, it feels like for a while there, we were keeping students from taking risk, and risk is important. And just go ahead and assign some things that you're not going to do well at. You're going to have to take a risk and know that, well, that didn't work out the way I thought it was going to work out, and guess what? Everything is still okay. So risk-taking behavior, appropriate risk-taking behavior can be <laughs> helpful too. Um, yeah, I think in a low stakes situation, I was try I was just sitting here thinking from a classroom teacher perspective, one of the ways you can do that is to, to pose your feedback in terms of a growth mindset. You know, really pointing out what's going well and what you seem to have really mastered. And then here's, here are some areas for growth that we're not there yet, but we're gonna get there. 
and also uh, just a low stakes kind of an activity where there's not grades or something attached to it, but where you've got to take a risk in order to complete the activity, you know, take some of that pressure off, but you know, you were wrong and guess what? It was okay. It all turned out all right. We're all wrong from time to time, so that's fine. Um, last question. What uh, we, and I think we've had this situation in the past, what about um, maybe a teenager who is literally avoiding going to school because the anxiety is so high? Um, they, they are finding it very difficult to even broach going to school. Yes, so I touched on that a little bit in my presentation, but that is certainly a time that I really think some professional guidance might be helpful. It may be that that professional person suggests some type of anti-anxiety medication, just so the person can feel in a place to think and move through the strategies that might help them. Mm -hmm. And I do find that exposure therapy is really helpful in that situation. So once they are feeling better about thinking of, okay, I might be able to go to school. What are those steps that they can take? Like, is it just looking through the yearbook at first? Is it talking to someone who goes to the school? Is it talking to the counselor at that school before they even attend? Is it touring the school, going to their desk, meeting the teacher? All those graduated steps until it becomes, okay, now you're actually in the school. Do you have a buddy that's going to be with you sometimes? And do you have that designated place that you might go to? If for whatever reason you're feeling a bit anxious at school. Absolutely. Great suggestions. Well, I can't thank you both enough. This was excellent. And, and, and I, there's no way anybody sat in this and did not come away with some strategies that we can use for ourselves right now, certainly, but certainly with our kids. Um, and, and you all did a magnificent job. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to those of us who, um, those of you who are still with us um, as participants, um, we will be sending out um, uh, the slides, uh, the links that were in the slides uh, so that you can click on those and you'll also get a link to the video of tonight's presentation. So if you feel like you want to hear a piece of it again or go back over something or maybe even share a segment with your child, you could do that. So thank you all for joining us tonight at Hill and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.